So Amy, thanks for joining me. Thanks for doing this. I know you've, uh, you've read a lot about this, your, your legal insight. Give us your take, big picture on St. Louis's lawsuit against the Rams in the NFL. Well, I'm actually pretty shocked that the judge ruled that he believes that there was a contract between the city and the NFL and uh, the Rams and that it was sort of formed through the relocation policy that in fact, the relocation policy of the NFL, which is an internal procedural policy that the NFL created on its own would form the basis of a contract. That's really mind boggling for me. Um, so that's obviously not gonna be a really popular opinion with the people watching this. But my take is that, listen, this is happening in St. Louis. The NFL tried to get it removed in the interest of fairness to another venue that was denied. You have a St. Louis judge, you're gonna have jurors that have an interest in the city and in the finances of the city. So to me, this is not really that fair to the NFL. I don't see how there's a contract when it was not negotiated between the city and the NFL, when there were no mutual agreements or promises. And basically what the judge did is read in that the language that was created by Roger Goodell in the NFL, which puts obligations to negotiate in good faith with the city before leaving, uh, that that was a obligation and a promise that was definite and that formed the basis of a legal contract. And I just think it's really controversial to be completely honest with you, just from a legal perspective, someone who doesn't really have a horse in the race. Um, there was this lawsuit uh, by Oakland when the Raiders were relocated to Las Vegas and a federal judge actually said, no, Oakland didn't have any standing to sue over the NFL's internal policies. So to me, that was the right decision. And I think this one is definitely a stretch. Okay, so in your mind then, I guess the question is why have guidelines if they don't matter? And you know, I, I, I had you on specifically to talk about the Rams situation, but I would think this has a lot of repercussions and a precedent for what's going on in Chicago and Buffalo. It, it seems like the NFL is saying, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna stick to the guidelines. That's what they at least told St. Louis. Then they get to court and they're like, these guidelines don't mean anything. Right, well, I think two things. One, I think maybe there's a fraud case here. I, I don't buy that there's a contract here and that there's a breach of contract. Maybe there's fraud where there's misrepresentations that were made that led the city to invest money to believe that they were actually negotiating in good faith with the team and with the league and that their outpouring of money and efforts was going to be able to keep this team in the city when meanwhile, all along the plan was to just string them along and to relocate and just you know have this lucrative explosion for the owners of the team and then everybody else is sort of left out in the dust. So, so perhaps in terms of that, when you talk though about reliance on a contract, really the collateral for taxpayer money on a stadium is supposed to be the lease. The lease of the stadium is really the contract that the city's relying upon when it says, okay, here's what we're going to do to, you know, to uh, support this team. And here's the taxpayer money or the government resources that we're going to expend to keep them here. Now, a condition of the lease in this case was that the stadium had to be up to a certain standard. And so to not get the stadium up to that standard which triggered a portion of the lease that allowed the team to go year by year. And then afterwards to say, well, now we want to fix it when the team's already decided that they're leaving. They've lost the benefit of that security that the lease forms uh, for the team to say, OK, as long as you do X, Y, Z, which is your part of the bargain, then the team is going to stay and, and they're bound by that lease, which is a contract. So I think that's where their protections were. Now, of course, the government can also say, hey, before we expend any resources or efforts, we want to negotiate a contract with you. We want to sign it and we want you to make guarantees to us that you're going to give us a certain amount of time. But to say that the government and all these third parties are relying on an NFL policy that could really change at any minute because it's an, an, it's an internal policy, right? So the NFL can go and literally the next day just rewrite it. You can't do that with a contract. You can't just at will break it and change it and, and write language that you decide without consulting with the other side and having some sort of a quid pro quo there. Okay. And people in, on St. Louis's side would say, well, you had this dog and pony show where you had town halls. I mean, St. Louis had a group together 
uh, Peacock and Blitz put together a stadium proposal. There was an actionable stadium plan, which LA, the, the Chargers, the San Diego Chargers didn't have that. The Oakland Raiders didn't have that. So if you go back five, six years of the three teams that were being talked about to be relocated, St. Louis was the one team that had that stadium plan in place. And that's where all throughout that process where you have the renderings of the stadium, they're trying to get sponsors on board. The NFL did act like St. Louis had a chance where behind closed doors, we now realize that's, that's not the case. Yeah. And I think that's why there's probably a strong fraud case there. And that's where the evidence of what was going on behind closed doors in contrast to the representations that were being made in the public will come in handy. But I think it's it's really is interesting because what you have is you have essentially an argument that the NFL was negotiating on behalf of the city when it created its internal policy, which again, I don't think it's a contract. I think it's a policy, but let's say we were to just uh, entertain the theory that it's a contract. Then the argument would be if the city's a third party beneficiary and they're a third party beneficiary because the NFL put language in there to protect them, including language specifically saying that the stadium and the city were interested third parties. Well, then you would really, in a court of law, need the NFL to come to the city's rescue and say, yes, we were sort of standing in on behalf of the city. And when we negotiated this contract with the team, uh, it was for the benefit of the city. But you don't have that here. You have the party that you're saying was intending to protect the city saying, no, 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 that's not how we intended it. We, you know, this is just between us and the club. And, and we never uh, put that language in there to form the basis of like standing for the city to sue if the club doesn't abide by our internal policies. That's between us and the club. So, so that's where I think the argument legally fails. So it sounds like from your standpoint that the NFL in your mind has a, a pretty good case right now, it's either going to be a settlement or a trial in January. What's the likelihood in, in your opinion that the NFL would settle or potentially go to a trial? And then if there is a trial, do you think the NFL has a legit chance to actually win that? I think it, it could go 50, 50. I think it would be wise to settle uh, because I think that the NFL will undoubtedly lose because of the venue, because of the makeup of the jury, and because of the way that the judge pretty definitively put his perspective into this, uh, his order on the uh, summary judgment. He made a decision when the NFL had tried to dismiss this on summary judgment, meaning it there were no triable issues of fact left, and that it shouldn't go to a jury because really uh, there's nothing to decide. And, and then the judge said, no. I believe that the jury should have an opportunity, but also put in his perspective, which was a very strong and definitive um, ruling that said he believes there was a contract, that there was unjust enrichment, and that there was fraud. So I think that's going to be persuasive on the jury, especially given all of the publicity. But what I will say is there's such a thing as a promissory estoppel, and promissory estoppel is a legal uh, concept where if you make promises to somebody and they rely upon those promises, then you do sort of create this quasi contract. And I think it's interesting because normally when you talk about contracts between parties, uh, they're usually private uh, negotiations and private relationships. Here, you have a private corporation, but they're making public representations. And then the public, the city and the stadium and the government reps are all relying on those public representations. So I think that's where that this takes this case sort of in the realm of completely unique. And, and that's why the judge really went out on a limb here and said, well, yeah, it's not your average contract. It wasn't negotiated by the two parties directly. It wasn't put in writing. There weren't mutual obligations. But I still think because of the public nature of the relationship between the fans, the reliance of government on the stadium and on the promises of the league and the team, um, I'm going to read a contract into this situation. But again, I think the fact that it's just an internal policy that's written entirely by the NFL can be changed at any moment. Um, I, I, I think it's a stretch. I really do. That being said, they'll probably win because of the venue. That's my opinion on it. So in your legal opinion, you see it as a guideline versus a, a contract, which obviously St. Louis is arguing that it's a contract. But you did say 
that you think there's potentially fraud there. So if the NFL were to settle or to lose, what type of monetary uh, benefits do you think St. Louis could get? We're also hearing, you know, the NFL, St. Louis wants them to open up their books basically for punitive damages. So what do you think a, a settlement or a, a judgment could, uh, could give the city of St. Louis uh, if, if they were to win? Yeah, I think um, probably in the millions of dollars, I've heard, you know, this, this number thrown out billions of dollars, uh, you know, punitive damages and, and all different types of damages, you know, that there are different types of damages. So punitive would be to punish, obviously, but there's expectation damages, there's exemplary damages. So I just see it as uh, the NFL settles for maybe the cost, pl a cost plus model what was expended by the city. Um, I don't see it going into the realm of what was expected and lost. Um, and then there's this whole analysis also on the monetary side of, well, now the franchise is worth, you know, oodles more because they're in Los Angeles. But to me, I mean, that's attributable to the fact that they're in that location versus in St. Louis. If you have the team in St. Louis, they wouldn't be worth that. So really, I don't think you can factor in the boost to their value due to the move. Um, so I think, yeah, just in, maybe in the millions of dollars, but it could go to trial. It really could because the NFL certainly has the money to spend and they might have an interest in not having this type of precedent on the book. Though, like I had mentioned before, they are uh, protected by the, um, the federal precedent with the Oakland case that we had talked about earlier. But there's also a possibility of maybe they expand and they create a team for the city. And that's happened before in the past. It happened when uh, Cleveland wanted a team and the Browns were, were relocated to Baltimore. And so that's a little bit of history on that side. But there's a lot of different things that could happen here. I think the one motivating factor would be that the ownership doesn't want to have to open their financial records. And then you've also got so many other team owners that are going to be dragged into this and have to open their financial books. If the monetary amounts in the millions, now, I don't think St. Louis would settle for that. Now, if that comes about from the trial, that's one thing. But let's say the number okay, is so, billions. So, Charlie, tens of millions then. Right. OK. And I, I still think I <laughs> it's think it's not going personally. billions. I don't think it's no, no. way. I, I get that, but I think St. Louis is out for blood in the sense that they wouldn't settle for, for millions. So if it, if it goes to a trial, let's just say hypothetically, let's say it is a larger number and expansion is on the table where the NFL, they don't want to open the books. They want to even right or wrong in a way, because mm -hmm. you know I do think St. Louis was treated unfairly. How would that work if you, if you give an expansion team, you have lawyers working really hard for St. Louis. How does that work out if, if a big part of your, of your settlement is going to an expansion team? I mean, how, how would that even work? But that might be something that St. Louis would be happy to do. You know, they may not be angry about it because you have to think about where does their anger stem from? Is it from the fact that they were misled? Is it from the fact that, that their team left? Um, is it from the fact that, um, I don't know, name something else that they lost money. What, what, where does it come from? And so if you're, I've majored in conflict resolution. And so one of the factors in negotiating a settlement is to decide what would create a win-win for all of the parties. And in order to do that, you have to see, well, like what's at the root of this person's emotional response to what's going on? And if you can sort of satisfy that in a way that doesn't uh, hurt the other side, but also caters to that other side's interest, then you create the win-wins. So I think that it's, it's a possibility that, that that could be something that would solve the problem and, and put a Band-Aid on uh, the sore that the city is feeling. Well, Amy, really appreciate the time, even though uh, some of my St. Louis uh, viewers and listeners won't necessarily love <laughs> your opinion, but it's a very interesting legal opinion. We've been trying to get uh, different lawyers locally, nationally, uh, reporters that have covered this story in the courtroom. So I think it's very interesting to get all the different uh, all the different angles of this story. Well, let me just say, just just in my defense, so I don't you know <laughs> get too much <laughs> backlash here. My perspective is purely from a legal sense. I don't believe that an internal policy like we talked about that's written by the NFL is a contract. That being said, do I agree that it was right that they should say Roger Goodell and the ownership of the Rams should put 
representations and statements out there in the media that the city and that the government and the taxpayers and the vendors and the hotels and the stadiums are relying on and then behind the scenes be du duplicitous and be plotting something and not caring at all about the fan base or the effects of that? No, I disagree with that. And I think there should be a consequence for that. I just don't think that uh, the legal argument here is properly placed. So hopefully that will save me a little bit. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. That was that was well explained. I think that's St. Louis is is clearly most mad from losing the team, but also the way it went down where we know Stan, Stan Kroenke didn't talk for the whole time. And he did that because he's smart. But he had Kevin Demoff basically go out there and and lie or mislead for years and years and years. There's lots of audio. I mean, he spoke to every TV radio station print and, and he said all these things like, oh, you got a chance We're we're not going to leave. It's a it's a one percent chance. Oh, that plot of land is not for a football stadium. When then after the fact, he's talking to L.A. reporters, he's speaking at his high school. And clearly that right. was not what was going on behind closed doors. And that's fraudulent. I mean, that's I would I would say that I would say that that's fraudulent behavior. And so there is a legal basis for that. So anyway, I wish the city good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. Take care.